Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zinger show with me, your host Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 291291291. Come estás, mi amigos? Good. Hope you guys are feeling well, hope you guys are going to be feeling great. I'm feeling amazing as per usual. We're going to get right on into the show because we've got so much to run into. But in case you're wondering, this is actually on Zinger Show, live and direct from YouTube or via your audio streaming podcast that you listen to podcasts on. Um, I do this every week. I talk about loads of things in culture, you know, current events, political stuff, streetwear, hip hop, music, techno, club culture, fashion, all that stuff in between. If you like what you're hearing and you want to see some more, hit subscribe, smash that like button, leave me a comment. If you're listening via the podcast app, sh- leave a five-star review and share it with your friends. Let everyone know about what I'm doing here. Get the word out, spread it loud and often and allow me to get my message out there to more people. That's all I ask for. That's it. Nothing more, nothing else. Okay? So, let's get straight into the show. As I'm sure most of you are aware, living in the world right now, we're in a pandemic at the moment in most places. Um, I know the UK has officially, um, well, yeah, the UK is officially in a, Oh no, the, the 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 World Health Organization declared a pandemic, didn't they? So it is a pandemic regardless of where you are. Um, unfortunately, we're suffering uh, the consequences of the coronavirus that emanated from this tiny, tiny place in China called Wuhan. That I'm sure a lot of people didn't know existed before this issue. So maybe that's one of the unintended benefits. You know, people are now a little bit more globally aware. Their geography has maybe improved slightly. People are now aware that there's other places in China, except for Beijing and Hong Kong. You know, debatable about Beijing. Yeah, let's go continue. So, um... I'm happy um, in that regard. But of course, the sadness of it is that unfortunately we're in a period now where there is probably going to be a lot more deaths before we get to a place where stuff starts to mellow down a little bit. Uh, We're going to lose a lot of our population. Some of them are going to be elderly people who are still valuable. I don't really get this whole idea that, oh, it's only elderly people. It's like, don't you guys have elderly relatives? Don't you know people who are above the age of, you know, whatever age you are? It's just a bizarre way to look at the world, isn't it? Oh, they're old anyway. So what do you mean they're old anyway? Don't you have teachers? Don't you have people that run stuff that you have to go to? It's, like, it's a bizarre fascination. It sort of, sort of reminds of how the fashion industry is obsessed with youth, yet most of the brands are bought by people who are over 35. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But anyway, we digress, or I digress. So it's a real um, big um, effort in terms of the scientists and the health organizations to get the word out there, to get people to believe it. And Finch, unfortunately, I think we're living we're living in a weird time in it because it's like there's been such a there's been such a weird sort of concerted effort against intellectualism or intellectuals in general or expertise. It feels as if like you know maybe I'm part of the problem with the whole YouTube channels and stuff, but it seems as if we live in an era where a lot of people are worried or no, a lot of people are skeptical about authoritative figures coming in and telling us what to do. It might stem from, you know, the political elite class of like the Hillary's and the Bushes, and sorry, the Clintons and the Bushes of the world who essentially led people down the wrong path. You kind of saw people in a dream and, you know, especially the American public or the world in general got a bit smart to it and realized that even though these people have, you know, smart suits on and they speak in a particular way and they have all these anecdotes, they don't know anything. They don't know more. They don't have as many, they don't have more sense then you or I, right? They may know more in terms of what's going on in the country because they get briefed by government officials, but it's not as if they're like um, unflappable, right? So as if they're not going to make, not, not not make mistakes, right? They're obviously going to make mistakes. So I think because of that, it's kind of led to a, we're in a place now where people just in general just don't trust what comes out of the government, right? They just don't trust it. So unfortunately, there's still pop, part of the population that is, you know, still, um, I don't know. They still believe as if this thing is a joke. Like it's, uh, I don't know, like it's, um, like it's a weird allergy thing or something. And I have allergies, right? I'm suffering from them at the moment. I've always suffered from them since the age of 18. Unfortunately, prior to me turning 18, I was perfectly fine. I didn't have any allergies to speak of. I played a lot of football during that time too. I used to play Sunday league, Saturday league, men's football, um, football during the week. Most of the cages I played in during the week were in parks where a lot, especially in the area that I was in, there was a lot of pollen around, right? I saw a lot of kids do to sneeze in my area and they chew everywhere. Um, you know, bogey running down their faces, um, not covering their mouths, of course, back in those days. But I do remember there was a time where I didn't have any allergies and suddenly I turned 18 and allergies, you know, appear again. Might be sports related allergies or whatever it may be. Or maybe it was part in, partly due to the asthma I kind of suffer from, which is not, it's like kind of a seasonal asthma. It kind of only kicks in when the summer comes around and I have to kind of get an inhaler from the GP. But 
you know, having an allergy nowadays is not fun, man. I sneeze on a train, people are scaring. If you see a video of that of that kid somewhere in, in Europe and he's like, he starts screaming and he starts screaming and dancing and everyone just runs away and then he gets a seat and someone's like, you know, people put a meme about, oh, if you want to get a seat on a busy train, just start doing the dance thing and people will just run away because especially in London, people don't want to be bothered. They want to get to work, they want to go meet their friend and go home. They don't want anyone else kind of like raining in their parade. So um, that was quite a funny video, but that's what having allergies is like now at the moment in London. It's just absolutely nuts. So, but there's still a lot of people that don't believe it. I think I saw the other day. Um, I got an email from Box Park, which is this weird little, you know, sort of like retail bar restaurant sort of unit things that are made in little crates that they put around. I think they got one in Brixton. They got one in Shoreditch. They probably have some or located all around the world. They're a cool little. They're a great way to do like a pop up shop shopping mall without you know having the infrastructure that you need to kind of build one without having to build you know put in you know concrete bricks up or glass buildings or whatever maybe you can essentially put a couple of crates together in a clever way obviously well insulated done really well up to spec blah 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 and then you can also create like a little you know a little uh, hipster shopping mall hangout people go can go to after work and get drunk get fed and have a dance so that was um i got an email from their ceo i think it's like a, pr a marketing email information email just to kind of make ever sure everyone's abreast of the situation which essentially kind of said hey the government has, has, hasn't told us to close down, so we're not going to close down. We're going to open for business on the weekend. Which, you know, is their prerogative. I think a lot of businesses are in that position now where if the gov they're kind of following what the government mandate is. But I think we're in a place now where if you read enough accounts, for, especially from especially an, an account I read from um, a, doc a, a journalist from Italy. Let me see if I can get up on my Twitter, actually. It was a pretty cool um, op-ed that he read, I think, in the Boston in the Boston Herald or one of those kind of newspapers, right? And he essentially said that, I think he's Italian too, and he basically said that we should take um, heed or lessons from the Italian the Italian epidemic or the Italian, Italian pandemic and kind of make the adjustments that we need to make now instead of waiting later on uh, because those adjustments are going to prevent, are going to allow us to, pre are going to prevent a lot of unnecessary deaths. But... It seems as if a lot of nations, the UK included, are waiting for it to get really bad before they make the necessary adjustments, which is understandable too, because I think there is this assumption that if you make a move now and tell people to kind of stay indoors, um, you know, not to go anywhere, lockdown, to be very vigilant, it's going to make people hysterical and they're going to go out there and start, you know, queuing outside of shops ahead of time, you know, especially before the time of uh, lockdown and people are just going to go overboard and go crazy. So maybe doing it in a gradual, slow way is the right way to go about things to avoid a riot on the streets and shit, especially if, if the hospitals are lacking beds and lacking adequate nurses. And I'm sure the police forces don't have enough people to kind of man the streets and make sure people are not getting stabbed over, you know, over a baguette somewhere. So I definitely get that. But um, this article, hopefully I'll find it here, definitely spoke about it a lot more succinctly than I am going to do it now. And I'm going to quickly read it to you. It's from the Boston Globe, right? And it kind of outlines a lot of the issues that are kind of happening now um, with the coronavirus um, kind of spreading and people just not taking it seriously. And I, and I would say I would kind of level that kind of uh, sentiment towards the UK and the US. It seems that the UK and the US isn't just, you know, we're just not in a place to kind of deal with this stuff in a sensible, rational way until it gets to a really, really bad place, which is unfortunate to see, really. So let's just uh, make sure I've got this all loaded. Open it up a little bit. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. So this is um, a, an article from the Boston Globe. It's called A Coronavirus Cautionary Tale from Italy. Don't do what we did, right? And it's uh, from a guy called Mattia, Mattia Ferra, Ferrarisi. I'm going to link in the show notes for you guys to read yourselves, but I'm going to quickly go through it and it's going to kind of lay the groundwork for my kind of overall thoughts on the situation. So he says the following. Um, there was a headline in March 11 in the whatever Italian newspaper that is, a leading newspaper in Italy that informed us that hospitals in Italy's north, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in our country, were being stretched thin and the healthcare system was on the brink of collapse. An anesthesiologist at the hospital of Bergamo, one of the cities in the most cases with the most cases of COVID-19, the illness caused by the new coronavirus, told the paper that the intensive care units were already at capacity and doctors were being forced to start making difficult decisions, admitting people who desperately need medical um, uh, mechanical. Yeah? mechanical ventilation based on age life expectancy and other factors just like in wartime the article was impeccably placed on page 15 while the main headline on the newspaper front page relayed the political quarrels over the measurements to the curb the contagion so as per 
usual there is a sentiment at the moment that instead of actually dealing with the issue um putting in some preventive measures there's a lot of infighting a lot of finger pointing a lot of finger wagging and just a lot of blaming in general right which is definitely not the there is a time and a place for that i'm pretty sure especially if you want to gain an advantage on your political rivals but now especially with the looming danger of this getting worse before it gets better it's just not the time for it, is it but anyway the article continues here it says the hospital in bergamo was not only the hospital in the area dealing with the lack of capacity and rationing of care the same day i heard from a manager in lombardy healthcare system among the most advanced and well-funded in europe that he saw an anesthesiologist weeping in hospital hallways because of the choices they were having to make in the days since over one hospitals have set up tents as makeshift hospital wards and cargo containers have been placed at the entrances of medical centers to sort out patients coming at an increasing pace some of the people who can't can't get medical care are dying in their homes which is one of the most um sad things to hear because I think for the most, especially in diff it's different regions, different countries have different things. I always get the impression that, especially in the UK, we don't really give a shit about our older people, our older population. I remember there was a time when I was younger. Well, when I was younger, my aunt used to live in a place next to, are they called allotments or I forgot what they're called? Uh, bung bungalow? Is it bungalow? I think it's a bungalow, right? Bung yeah, allotments or garden. I think my, my aunt used to live in an area that was surrounded by bungalows, right? So predominantly bungalows are like these one level homes that are really sparse and really big and really easy accessible and they're usually built with elderly people in mind, right? So they can navigate and be independent and get around their house without having to navigate upstairs and shit. So it's pretty well done and they're pretty well laid out. So there's a lot of those places in um, in the UK, especially in London. But I guess over time, due to gentrification, all that stuff, and maybe with the population aging out in some respects, those houses have now been getting demolished and they've been getting turned into like little, you know, epicenters of cool, um, you know, shiny metal and glass um, structures for people to sit in and drink, you know, 10 pound coffees in. And essentially, um, and then I also, I'm pretty sure, I'm not too sure, I have another research, but I'm pretty sure the funding for like old people's homes or care homes essentially has gone down. So a lot of those places where you could send older people who probably couldn't live in a bungalows on their own are, you know, far, few and far between. If there are, those are available, they're probably, you know, way out of people's price ranges. So generally, there's like a lack of kind of empathy or care given to older people or older population. But you get the feeling like it's Italy, Spain, maybe places in France have a different relationship with their older population, right? There's a lot more respect. There's a lot more honor. There's a lot more uh, reverence given to an older generation because, you know, they've been there, done that, wore the T-shirt. So people, regardless if they're your own relatives or not, have a lot of respect for them in general. So they try and, you know, and they sometimes, especially in, I'd imagine in kind of, you know, um, Mediterranean uh, communities, you know, older people are revered in the family, right? They're maybe, they're probably sometimes the the only living relatives that you might have, right? They maybe have outlasted your parents or maybe they're the only people kind of holding it down in your own city because your parents moved away to, you know, seek fame and fortune and they were still there. Or maybe, you know, your parents split up and you have to live with your aunt, your granddad or grandma. So there's a lot of kind of um, respect given to them, right? People still live with their grandparents sometimes in those kind of countries, in, you know, in their in their 30s and shit. So I guess for an Italian community to have, you know, people that they know and love, older people, dying of a virus that they didn't know existed a few weeks ago, it must be really distressing. And again, I think that's what's caused them to react. Whereas I think in the UK, because we don't really have to have that relationship with our older population, I think it's going to take, you know, somebody prominent, maybe somebody that we know in pop culture to die, unfortunately, um, for us to kind of really gain an understanding of what's actually going on. Because you're seeing it anyway happening in general, right? You're seeing how people are reacting positively or reacting in a more productive or proactive way when they heard the football was getting cancelled. So imagine if, you know, I'm not going to say a name, but imagine if a name, X name of a celebrity who happens to be um, under the age of what you expect people to die from coronavirus ends up getting passes away. That's when people wake up to it. But you don't want that really. You want preventive measures now. But anyway, let's continue the article. Da, 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 da. So, um, in a day since yeah, so, so it's here. as more medical professionals started to describe their similar situations on social media and interviews the Italian Society of An Anesthesiologists published extraordinary new guidelines to help doctors facing an ethical dilemmas making clear that the first come first serve criterion that had been used amongst patients with same illnesses and level of risk in ordinary times was not appropriate in dealing with the current emergency right so until last week the Italian public health care system had a capacity to care for everyone our country has a universal health care so patients 
aren't turned away from hospitals here. But in a matter of days, the system has been uh, failed by a, by a virus that I and many other Italians had failed to take seriously. And that is really sad because I remember someone saying the same thing that the reason why this is going to get worse is because there is a preventative measures in place to make sure that we don't have um, a surge of people going to hospital at the same time. What you want to do is that you want to con- have people contained, contained in some regard or take better care and not do unnecessary travel or all that stuff so that the virus doesn't spread as aggressively as it should do. Or if you're kind of just, you know, going by your everyday life so that the hospitals could then have a kind of like a, a staggered period of kind of receiving people in, making sure they're treated, sending them home and then taking the new people in. But if everyone's getting sick at the same time, at high amounts and catching the virus all at one time and they're all flying the hospitals, they're not going to be enough bed for everyone. So it's it's a really di- it's a really sad indictment if you get to a point where you're kind of building overflow tents. It means you didn't prepare prior. Um, so it continues. Um, the inability of the medical system to deal with the flow of patients in critical condition is not one of the problems of this complex medical is one is not one of the problems of problems medical no sorry the inability of the medical system to deal with the flow of patients in critical condition is not one of the problems of this complex medical emergency it is the problem i shouldn't have to be surprised as a journalist i have read heard and spoken to several experts claim explaining the most um Immediate threat to COVID-19 was hospital systems becoming overwhelmed, as I mentioned, and therefore the most pressing need was to avoid too many people getting sick at the same time as resources are limited. It's what's called flattening the curb. I could find the curve, sorry. But the, that information was somehow stored in some remote in, um, intercise uh, of my mind, covered in an incessant flow of bits and charts on the morality uh, rate of the elderly, political mismanagement, and quarrels over under testing and over testing, market collapses, projections of the economic impacts of the epidemic, and so on. All of this, of course, extremely relevant, but at the same time, feels totally irrelevant when lives are being lost in a situation that was preventable. As of Friday night, 1,266 people have died in Italy due to the outbreak. And again, this can all be avoided if we the preventive measures. So again, I, I guess I really recommend you check it out. It's a really long article. I won't read the whole thing, but it's very, very informative. And then one thing that kind of, again, leads you to see how people are not taking it seriously. I think the other day was St. Patrick's Day, right? Um, on Friday. Was it Friday the 13th? Was St. Patrick's Day or maybe it was a Saturday? And for some unknown reason, some most, uh, quite a few Americans actually thought it would be a good idea uh, to head out to the bars and clubs in that in in Chicago for the most part and partake in St. Paddy's Day activities. You can't really blame the Americans that much. I think if they're taking advice or if they're taking heed from what the president's saying and you've seen what Don Trump's been saying lately, he's been you know talking a lot of fluff when it comes to the situation. Maybe they kind of felt it's not as bad as it, it could be. So they have maybe a time to go out. And I get the impression, especially from the UK too, because I saw a lot of people going to see Dax J play at E1. It was meant to be Dax J and some other guy as well, but he dropped out. Um, so Dax J ended up playing an extended set. And I'm seeing a lot of people kind of, a lot of people went out there and partied and stuff. So I think there is a sentiment, I feel as if like on social, especially with the younger community, where they feel as if like this week and maybe next week is the last time you could probably go out. So they're going to party like it's 1999 and get on it, whatever it may be. And then, you know, knowing full well that most likely to, more likely than not you're probably going to be in a lockdown next week i assume so that's what people are doing it feels like it but anyway this video just surfaced now on my twitter as well that kind of shows exactly what the fuck is going on and how dire the situation is because people just aren't taking the situation seriously so this is a, a video here from this journalist i'm assuming called a uh, king kraus right and he spoke to some young people who are celebrating the saint patrick's day um festivities now and asked them why they're not taking it seriously so I'm going to get her on the screen so you can hear and hear what they're saying. Worried that gatherings like this will potentially spread the virus? Yeah, you, you know what? I'm not worried. I know it will. Like, it's not like, like, it's not, it's not a question. That's, that's, that's not a question because it, it will definitely spread the disease. Although, um, you know, do what you can. If you're sick, don't go. If you, you know, do what you can. If you're sick, don't go. If you, uh... <laughs> You can't really take anyone seriously dressed up like that, and it's just like a little leprechaun. He's got his little St. Patrick's Day um suit on, with his little hat on, having a whale of a time. But I don't know, man. Like again, like I said, I think the war on intellectuals, the war on expertise, the war on specialists, and the fact that you have a president in like and again, that's probably why people are so sensitive to the politicians and political um trends or whatever it may be. Um, 
somehow they have a way of kind of permeating society, right? Like if your leader is acting in one way and is a bit aloof and is a bit, you know, fly off the seat of his pants and just says what he says and, you know, off the cuff and doesn't read a teleprompter and kind of just like, you know, makes up facts and stuff. Then, of course, you're going to have a nation of people who are a little bit oblivious. They're a little bit, um, you know, against maybe the status quo in that respects. Um, they think life is one big game of business and investments or I don't know, like when it takes all stuff, it might have a way of permeating through society. So this is probably a, a, a consequence of that overall, or it just could be a, a, a reflection of a, of a, of a different country's responses to things, right? Everyone's got a different way of responding to stuff. Some people just treat it differently. Like, you know, have you, have you seen the difference between the, you know, the American, American idol and, you know, X factor, for instance? Two different, two completely different shows, isn't it? Like, because of course the contestants make the show, um, and we have a different kind of uh, way that we go about things and how we carry ourselves in the UK than maybe North America does. So I don't know who to kind of blame for it, but I don't know, man. If I was a young kid and I had access to the internet and I had social media and I was reading stuff online, the last thing I'd be doing is like, you know, going to a bloody uh, St Patrick's Day event. Like, I don't know. I heard some people on Twitter like talking jokingly about, oh, they were, I don't want Carnival to get cancelled, but I'm, I'm sure it's a kind of done in a kind of banter way. You don't necessarily care about Carnival. Because again, like, who's going to go to Carnival when this stuff is still going on? Like, yeah. If, if you're worried about it, then don't go. If you do attend these, be in isolation after the fact. I'm like, doing it. I'm going to do your part for the community. Are you worried that gathering... Jesus Christ. Another one here? No mess. Yeah. So, 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 oh, so what is, actually the actual tweet says here last week Kingston Police Public Health and Queen's University urged students not to attend Patrick's Day at parties say the university district streets are filled with students many telling me they aren't afraid of COVID-19 imagine saying you're not afraid of a airborne virus you're not afraid of it as if it's like um, I don't know as if it's some kind of creature that's going to come out and attack you in the streets how can you not be afraid of something does that make any sense, does it? <sighs> yeah, so this tweet here says, members of the Kingston Police are in the University District directing students onto the sidewalks and off the streets. Yeah. 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 Imagine, that, that's what I'm saying, like, I have sympathy for them too. Imagine, you see how difficult it's been for the Italian um, government to try and get people to listen. Oh no, the Spanish government actually. They've kind of enforced a strict lockdown now and they've kind of enforced the fine system that they have in Italy where if you get caught um, outside and you don't have a, a written permission, then you essentially have the potential to be fined up to 2,000 euros, I think, or something, right? Crazy. So they have they've put a strict measure in place because people are taking a piss and still going outside, especially if you, some people are using their dogs as an as excuse, right? Because I think you can get an exemption. You can get an, an, an exemption if you've got a dog and you want to take it for a walk. So people are taking advantage of that and going out and having a walk and shit, or going out because they're bored. Um, so people are being incredibly selfish, I'd say, or maybe self interested So yeah, selfish, really, in this situation, and kind of uh, putting their own kind of uh, feelings above the possible health of others, which is mad, isn't it? But just imagine trying to herd a group of students off the streets of Chicago into their homes. It would be near on impossible. And then imagine trying to do that to a country that's already skeptical of the motives of the you know of the government and what they have in mind. It's just not going to happen, isn't it? So I continued here. It's this system, but I'm still only 21. I don't want to say but so. I'm not even. I have a well, compromised immune system, but I'm still only 21. But I'm not even worried because I just take supplements and like I self medicate, so it's fine. Yeah, she's she's definitely gonna wind up. I'm I'm sure that's not a real thing. But if she's not joking, then that girl's an absolute dumb nuts. But I'm sure it's a part of the bants in it. I'm sure she knows she's gonna be on camera. She's probably aware she wants to get a little viral moment. But as I think we've seen with this situation, it's not the time to kind of laugh and joke. I think memes are all good and all well and good. But in this situation where hundreds of thousands of people, I think some guy recently said that there's probably gonna be three three hundred thousand people who will die in America if this goes away. If it follows the same uh, pattern that is kind of followed in other places, um, up to three hundred thousand people might die. So it's gonna be a dark moment for all of us in content, all of us included. So. I don't know. Maybe jokes aren't the right time for it. Maybe it is the right time because such a bleak moment. I don't know, but I'm sure she's bantering. I'm sure it's not real. And then here continues here. Uh, the tweet says, "I spoke to Kingston M O H 
uh, this morning and he confirmed that no COVID-19 cases in the city. This week, Dr. Moore said it's common to treat hundreds of additional patients in St. Patrick's Day and said this is not a year to be socially irresponsible as St. Patrick's Day prepares a potential COVID-19 impact. Jesus Christ. And there's another one. Away from large crowds. Um, try not to touch people. Try to stay away from large crowds. Um, obviously, I'm not trying to be a party pooper. You know, if, you're gonna, if you want to go out, go out. But obviously, better to be safe than sorry in this case. So there are some people out there who have the sense. But again, it's a bizarre situation, man. Imagine wanting to go out that badly that you're going to put your life in jeopardy. It just doesn't make any sense in it. So then we continue on. And we have one last one actually to see. I want to hear what Walker Flock has to say. Because Walker Flock is sort of like, you know the jar of hip-hop right when something happens in society the first person you go to because you can't get hold of jar anymore because i'm sure his um publicist has told him to refrain from commenting on societal issues because he's a bit of a donut right he doesn't really you know he's not the smartest he's not the sharpest tool in the box or the sharpest knife in this drawer whatever it may be called how was that term it doesn't matter he's not that bright so now the the person to go to for those kind of unabashed um you know comments on society is probably Lil Boosie and maybe Waka Flock a second, right? Maybe even Lil Jamar. There's people that you kind of go to for those kind of like, you know, really crazy comments, right? I can't believe he said that. So here's Waka Flocker sitting down with um a radio station and talking about why what his thoughts are on the coronavirus. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's hear Waka Flocker's impression on things here. So coronavirus, <laughs> are we not, not worried about it at all? It's a, it's fake. You think it's an agenda? Yeah, I don't think minorities can't catch it. We sure. Walker Flocker thinks coronavirus is fake because black people can't get it. I don't know where this meme has come from. I think because we heard it was maybe because it kind of spread from Far East Asia and onto places in like Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe, and then the UK. Maybe you know, most of those countries are predominantly Caucasian or are predominantly Asian for the most part. So maybe that's part of it. And I don't know, but to suggest that black people cannot get a virus is insane. Nothing so far has proven that. There, there, might, be, there, there might not be as many cases uh, um, in the black community than there might be in the Caucasian community. I don't know, but this isn't like a white virus. What, like, this is, I, I don't even know how you, you can't even entertain this, but let's just listen to what it has to say anyway. Let's just listen, let's listen. They say that, that one know. more time. Minorities can't catch it. Minorities can't catch uh, He's laughing, let me smirk it. I, 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 I don't think he's being serious. He's, he's probably joking around, right? Why do you say? Why do you believe Name that? One. I don't know, but it could happen. <laughs> Name one, though. It could happen. Name one if of us. If it hasn't happened, it could happen. You know, we all like descended from the same person. I don't believe that. Now, we, I don't did we catch it? I'm, I'm just, guess. I'm not trying to... Didn't it hit Atlanta recently? That's the, that's the, like, that's the, like, the common retreat for uh, conspiracy theorists, right? They always, they always kind of throw out a wild statement or throw out a wild point of view or belief. Then when you question them on that belief, they ask you then to just they, then they ask you to kind of name the sources or to kind of bring up an example. When it's really on them to do that, right? If you're a conspiracy theorist and you believe the coronavirus doesn't affect black people, you should have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed in order to kind of provide the information I need when I'm gonna pressure you. Because you know for sure you're in a rarefied, you're in a kind of um you're in a lonely spot. You're by yourself, right? You know a lot, lot not a lot of people kind of uh, subscribe to your POV. So you should have some evidence, right? That you can kind of present like, aha, see, you think I was lying? Look, 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 look. But they don't do that, conspiracy theorists. They always have like a way of explaining why they, they think something doesn't match, doesn't isn't legit. But then when you press them on it, they're like, no, 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 I'm just saying that's just my opinion, you know? I'm just saying, I'm just throwing out a question. I'm just throwing out a question. Yeah, cool. You can throw out suggestions. You can have, you can have suspicions, but, you know, back up your claims. Don't just, you know, throw a stone and hide your hand behind your back. Yeah. No, it hit the people passing through our airport. Got it. Okay. It ain't touched them soul food, folks. <laughs> you know I mean, what? I don't even like the word minority because I feel like, are we really? The what do you mean soul food? Isn't isn't Walker Flocker a, a vegan anyway? So why why would he why would it not touch him when he's a vegan? Or would he? Or maybe actually thinking about that, he would probably say a vegan diet and being black has some kind of has some kind of effects on the, I don't know man the level of stupidity is insane the minority the no majority. we're majority exactly at this point. so that's what I'm saying <laughs> absolutely Walker how special is Tammy how sp <sighs> radio session interviews right coronavirus one minute next minute you're being asked about why you love your wife <laughs> so 
Okay, man. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you should be listening to Walk a Flock of Flame, actually, you know, regarding this issue. I think there are other sources that you should probably be going towards. And um, you should know what they are now. If you're, wait- if you're waiting to hear what Walk a Flock has to say about stuff, then you're probably, you know, already in a bad situation as it is anyway. But um, yeah, man. Walk a Flock doesn't believe it's real. Cool, isn't it? Cool. Let's move on. So, uh, um, what else I want to talk about here? Oh, actually, how it's going to impact um, restaurant workers. This is a really cool article, actually, from the BBC. Before we round up the coronavirus information and kind of move on to some more brighter things. So, I'll go from the BBC that says the following here. Um, coronavirus. Cafe and bar jobs gone by May. If laws don't change, says trade body, right? Which is... um. You know, something that I think a lot of us are aware of, I think the jobs that require people to attend, to be physically in a place somewhere, um, are going to affect people the worst, especially things that are, you know, you get paid by the hour, are going to be where people are going to really lose out. And unfortunately, we're in a position where now, I think there aren't necessarily any, there's not, there's not many safety nets for people who don't have, who have, who have a job that doesn't allow you to kind of, you know, take six days off or whatever, maybe or work from home. There's no real safety nets in there. Available at the moment. I'm not sure what universal credit is like. I'm not sure if people can sign in as easy as they did in the past. So it's going to be quite a bleak moment. And again, one of the places is going to suffer quite badly, especially now. Because I imagine this period of time, you know, from like March until April, June, July, is probably some of the most busiest periods for restaurants. I would assume so, right? I don't know how it works in restaurants. But does restaurants do, are restaurants more busy in the winter times or in the summer? I'd imagine summer season, right? Um, just you know, people tourists coming in and stuff. And people just generally went to sit outside and, you know, people watch whatever it may be. Um, and especially with the influx of restaurants, it always feels like there's always a restaurant or a bar popping up somewhere. So those places are going to be affected the most, um, especially places that have like a big workforce, right? They have loads of waiters, loads of bar staff, a couple of front of house people, loads of t- you know tables to uh, see. They're going to really, really feel it. And I'm sure I've seen a lot of of chefs online already complaining that they're having to let go of a few people because they just simply cannot afford to keep them on because there's no money coming in, right? Um, it's already difficult during the week, especially if you're in a populated city and there's loads of competition. It's already probably difficult to keep having enough water. Imagine then when, you know, a catch off event like this happens um, and you're in a position where people are not willing to go outside because they don't want to catch a virus, which essentially, you know, renders your, your business null and void. So this is an article from the BBC kind of touches upon this and explains it a little bit better than i just did there it says the following um hotel cafe and dining chains will fail and jobs will go if the government does not do more to help the industry a trade group has warned the chancellor in a letter to rishi sunak the lobby group hq hospitality said coronavirus was an existential threat to the sector it wants to change laws to allow temporary staff redundancy which is really good um uh, that'll be give them a little bit of a safety net and a cushion for like the next six months i did i did i did see um who said this um i think it was jason calcanis right the angel investor said that he advises all of his startups that he invests in or that he gives advice to to always have 18 months of runway left in their bank account runway is essentially like um you know savings that allow you to be to be operational if your product or service doesn't actually generate the money you think it's going to generate. But most businesses don't do that. Most businesses um, probably rely on six months of runway because they feel as if like, if they can't do it in six months, then why would they do it in 18? But I think the ease or the kind of lack of, I don't know, the lack of kind of um, pressure put on yourself to have 18 months of runway is probably beneficial in the long term because it allows you then to kind of get to work and figure out of some creative, interesting way to kind of make a business work, right? I understand the kind of fight or flight, oh, let's six months or, uh, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I would assume if you have 18 months runway, it does allow you to kind of be a bit more calm, a bit more rational and not kind of be a bit emotional and kind of make decisions just because you're afraid that you won't be able to kind of have CEO in your job title or in your bio um, if your business goes under in a really public way. So it continues here. It says in the following, in the letter uh, seen by the BBC, Miss Nicole suggested broader support for the sector, such as introducing measures to permit temporary staff redundancies where demand falls sub- sub- subsequently, right? With universal credit covering wage costs, which is awesome. Other government policies UK hospitality would like to see include a business rates holiday for businesses regardless of size, all payments to HMRC spended for three months, and government statutory sick pay payments to all hospitals and businesses. Jobs at risk. Miss Nicholls told the BBC 
that even some of the largest hotel chains pub chains and casual dining brands are all run a risk of not existing going forward which is definitely true um i think if you look at some of the especially the bigger weather spoons and stuff they're definitely going to suffer a lot from this as well um such economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic um this is business critical these are the cash businesses put simply if you don't have people coming through the door you will run out of cash very very quickly so we are talking about intervention that is needed next week to make sure that in uh, six to eight weeks, these businesses continue to trade. And if we don't get that bit support by May, we'll be facing um, business failures and significant numbers of jobs at risk. And I'm sure that they're, they're only kind of really getting on them to do this now. Or I, I assume the government will make a change and will kind of enact some kind of effort to make sure these businesses don't kind of fall by the wayside. Because, you know, most of the, especially most of the London boroughs, are uh, propped up by the restaurant and nightlife economy right they don't like to acknowledge it especially in nightlife economy they like to kind of close all the nightclubs and not allow them to kind of open for long and extended hours but they essentially are the the kind of the cash cow for the for the borough or the kind of city that you live in in the uk they're definitely bringing most of the money so i assume they will make some adjustments because once this coronavirus passes if we're left in a situation where you know people are still afraid to go out or they want they have the need to go out but there's no places to go and you know essentially people are partying indoors it's not going to serve the government well people are not going to be able to buy their villas you know in marbella anymore they're going to have to be able to have their second car or their second home somewhere in oxfordshire so it's within the it's, it's in their best interest to kind of sort this out asap really um so this is the following here uh this if this is affecting hospitality companies of all sizes and shapes it's high street businesses um that are seeing foot for decline so your pubs bars cafes and where you pop in for sandwiches but also it's the larger companies across the sector they are the firms that are employing the most people and definitely i agree with that one uh what else is here in sunak's uh, first budget this week businesses rates relief was guaranteed to companies at a relatable a uh, rateable value of less than 51,000. Uh, the measure applies to firms including shops, cinemas, and restaurants and hotels. However, Miss Nichols said that the that uh, because many of the biggest employers in the hospitality industry operate from the largest premises of the UK high street, they will not benefit from the new business rates at all. Jesus Christ. So, the following here, uh, three months left. The financial impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the hospitality sector is being shouldered by businesses large and small. But one hotel manager said businesses of his size were ignored by the Chancellor and are teetering on the brink. Mr. Cotman, in this group's uh, operations director at the York House Hotel in Eastbourne, and said his bookings are down by 60%. And he expects them to get worse. Bloody hell. We've got the money to carry on for maybe two to three months, he said. And then we're out of money. Then what do we do about paying staff, paying VAT, paying the vegman, the butcher? We'll run out of money, says Mr. Cotman. That is insane, isn't it? One event happens in like some small rural town somewhere in the middle of, in nowhere land China has impacted this guy in his hotel in Eastbourne. So much so it's led to essentially, you know, him having to let go of half his workforce people not be able to feed their families put a roof over their heads clothes on their back it's just insane isn't it like unprecedented this event man mama mia um so yeah the large businesses like ours have received no assistance to the budget we've been offered a facility to, of maybe applying for a loan but of course that's going to be it's going to be paid back if we're not taking any money how can we pay the loan back a treasury spokesman said on wednesday the chancellor announced a total of 30 billion fiscal stimulus to support british people jobs and businesses through the moment through this moment jesus christ tough times ahead man but yeah definitely an opportunity for people especially if you're gonna if you're gonna go out right and you're gonna go and have a drink tip your bartender tip your waitress uh tip the front of house tip whoever you can the money that they need in order to kind of survive because it's going to be some tough times for everybody involved so if you are going to go out which i don't suggest you do go out but if you do go out make sure you're uh, liberal and you're free with the whole tipping stuff and don't be tight that's my suggestion in that regards move on one last thing hopefully about corona then we'll move on to some other fun stuff here uh let's talk about something else i saw here what else i see that i thought was interesting i think it might be the dj thing in it right how is this is affecting the dj electronic music space so this is a tweet from let's see if i can find it. yeah there's a tweet from um a dj called darius cyro cyro russian i'm assuming he's one of those kind of tech housey djs right I'm not too familiar with him. But he put a tweet out. Basically, because I think he's been... Um, I think some people are getting called out. Especially some electronic music artists who are persisting with their gigs. 
and going for all their dates they have booked in. They're kind of promoting them out there and stuff. And some of it is kind of due to the fact that, unfortunately, we DJs are paid are only paid when they're present, right? They you can't if you cancel a gig, you can't get paid for that gig you cancelled. You can only get paid for things that you play at. Maybe some DJs have a uh, a system in place where they might get. I don't know some sort of cancellation fee. I don't know, but for the most part, being a DJ, you, if in order to get paid, you have to go to a place. You have to be physically there. So that kind of limits the amount of income they're able to make. Which is why I think ages ago I suggested, or I was surprised by a lot of DJs, especially in this era where everyone's so hungry for merch, and pay, and there's patrons are a big thing. Uh, I don't. I'm surprised why there's not many, more, not more DJs doing like a patron only group where you sign up for a certain amount a month and you get to hear Dixon talk about the inspiration behind an album or the inspiration behind a mixtape or behind a mix or behind an edit or a remix or just in general his thoughts i think that will do really well or just like you know patron only dj mixes or the other thing that i thought would be very beneficial is if dj just sold merch right imagine you got some designers on everpress to design you some sick merch and during your tour you just sold that after the tour you had a big box of stuff you put it in your luggage and you just slang it from the booth just people like cash in hand, twenty pounds, twenty pounds. Maybe you had a little Izetto machine. People just tapped in and bought your merch. I think that'd be pretty sick. And I would, again, I would be really down for it because I think a lot of DJ merch, especially some of the DJing in general or electronic music in general, it kind of attracts people from far and wide, right? So some of my favorite artists or DJs, they're from far flung places all over the globe. So sometimes I'm a bit hesitant about ordering stuff online because it just takes too long to come here, right? And you're not sure if it's gonna come anyway. But if I had the possibility of seeing a zip. Right, I've seen like a Ricardo Villalobos, a Raresh, uh, God, Yanza probably will never do much, but like a you know, uh, a young Marco playing somewhere who I love, right? And they and they happen to say, Hey, by the way, I've got some merch to sell, here it is. That'd be pretty cool. The only person I've seen doing it so far, um, was a shot. Wait, who is it? Who did the merch? Someone did really good merch recently that I thought was really nice, but it was kind of done in a very you know, and un- not undercover, but in a like kind of you know, low way. I think Peggy Goo does some merch too, but she does like. That's not that's not much. That's more like fashion, isn't it? She does those really cool, look, uh, short sleeve kind of uh, bowler shirt things, right? She has to do some merch like that. Good talk, right? Um, that's really nice. But I think she might be the only one. Like maybe it's a kind of a it's a kind of a cringe thing. People don't really want to do it. But I think in moments like this, it shows that there might be a need to kind of you know allow yourself to get a bit more extra income, especially if you don't make any tracks. You should be able to, um, you know, uh balance or kind of add to your income in some way shape or form because you know there's only so many gigs you can take in it there's only so many clubs and festivals out there but anyway i'm assuming this darius guy got a lot of stick for playing uh through the coronavirus outbreak i think post malone got the same sort of backlash too but you know it depends where you're playing at. if you're playing in a place where the coronavirus isn't as serious as a pandemic is in other places and the government says it's okay for people to gather in, in large groups then you just have to do it in it oh obviously there's some promoters who are kind of hiding behind that as a point not to counter the events, so you have to refund people. But I'm also sympathetic to the promoters and, and the event organizers because they had no idea. They, they're not putting on these events to make tons of money. They're putting on this event to kind of just throw a party, right? And have that as part of your CV because it's fun to tell people that you are, you know, you are the person behind this amazing party promotion that everyone's heard of. It's quite a cool thing to know. But anyway, let's get back to this Darius thing. He kind of justified his reason behind it. I thought it was a pretty cool person. Kind of uh, spoke really well in situations at hand now with the electronic music space and how we should maybe reframe the way we look at it. And if you are someone that's a bit skeptical or cynical about it, kind of view it from the artist's point of view. So here's the following. Um, if you're one of those giving me grief for doing my job last night, please also give uh, teachers, waiters, etc. grief too. There's no difference. We're just doing our job. When, when told not to, we will stop. P.S. I'm going to do what the country's chief scientific advisor says, not you. Definitely agree with that one. So here's the following. I love that sentiment, isn't it? Like I said, there's such a war on intellectualism or war on expertise that people are, you know, I don't know, especially, you know, who, 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 who was that aware of coronaviruses, right? Or COVID, you know, 19 before this thing, you know, kind of uh, permeated the public consciousness. Who was really aware of it? Now, all of a sudden, after a couple of Google searches, everyone's kind of aware of what you shouldn't or shouldn't do and it's telling other people to live their lives it's just not on in it really it's a bit out of order but anyway here's the following he said yeah for those attacking me for honoring my gig last night please read one me leaving my house to play some records and going home has the same risk as you going out of your house to buy food and going home agree if i didn't play my gig number two uh, the event will still go ahead it wasn't my party it's not my club i don't take ticket sales i get a fee to play records 
And number three, if the chief scientific advisor, the chief scientific advisor to the country, uh, Sir Patrick, uh, Sir Patrick Valance has said, for now there is no need to ban gatherings, clubs, schools, and restaurants, etc. Um, which I don't really agree with. I think that Patrick Valance has got a little bit of stick. I think a lot of uh, doctors and GPs have kind of, or doctors and nurses have come out and and kind of signed an open letter, which essentially calls calls him out and says there should be some preventive measures put in place to avoid the situation becoming bleak and becoming a lot more grave than it is now. Um, obviously, maybe Patrick Valance has got some kind of point, so Sir Patrick Valance has a point in terms of um, now, we don't, there's no need to panic now, but there should be some preventive measures being put into place where there is a suggestion maybe, you know, let's ban events, you know, more than 250 people so that people aren't gathering in nightclubs and bars, but they maybe are able to go out and stuff. That might be a solution. But anyway, what can you do? So it continues here. Um, if you're giving me grief, it's no different to giving a teacher grief or a waiter grief. We are all doing our job. People spend a lot of money on hotels, travel tickets to see me play. If I didn't turn up, I disappoint them. But the event would would ha would ha would, would still have to go on ahead of or without or without me. Finally, this virus is not going away. Isolation or not, the experts have a plan, and I'm going to trust their word over any jumped up idiot. Who wants to attack me for just doing my job, which is a bit much, really? I think he needs to chill out and wind it in a bit. I think people are a bit um, nervous and a bit afraid, naturally so, because this virus, you know, is essentially taking out, you know, vast amounts of our population. Maybe some in some in some places it's been projected to take out maybe five to ten percent of the population. Sometimes they're older, sometimes it could be younger, um, and it's something that's now going to be with us for a long period of time, maybe forever, right? Um, there are different strains of a coronavirus, of a of a coronavirus. Sorry, that I found out now, having done a bit of research myself. So it's something that we have to live with. We're probably going to have a vaccine. Uh, you know, what's it? Safe estimates are saying in eighteen months, which is a long time from now, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, which is something that you've kind of heard from a lot of professionals. So if people are are kind of a bit aghast why anyone would want to choose to go to see a DJ play over sitting at home and being safe i think it's perfectly fine to and again so maybe it's a false equivalency to you know ascribe going to a nightclub you know um for like 10 to 12 hours or whatever it may be um to going out to tesco's and buying a loaf of bread to feed your family right um how bad would you feel that you went to a nightclub to go see a dj play or how bad would the dj feel going to a nightclub to go play for however, however much money that is and then somehow being contracted with the virus would the would that gig money be worth your health and putting your family to je in jeopardy? Probably not. So again, I don't think it's the right of people or commentators to tell you what to do with your life, with your DJing career. And again, I have sympathy for DJs because I'm a DJ myself, a much lower level. But I know if I was a professional DJ, my my wage and my life and my you know uh, my mortgage relied on me, my ability to play gigs. And one of the gigs that I was playing on the weekend got cut out. That's essentially some money that's not coming into my account. It's not allowing me to feed my family and not allowing me to kind of be safe in general, right? Uh, there is no union set up for DJs. There's no kind of safety net. I'd imagine it's pretty difficult. So I do get sympathy for it. And again, from the promoter side, I'm being a promoter myself. I also know that, you know, some of the, some of the monies that you get maybe upfront from tickets or whatever they may be that might have already been spent to pay the dj or to secure the venue so you're you're literally running on negatives regardless to begin with right and the last thing that you want is to cancel the event and then to be hit with tons of refund requests that's obviously going to kill you too so i definitely respect and understand where they're coming from but i also think darius needs to chill out a bit and think you know people aren't attacking him because they think he's a bad guy they're attacking him because they think it's irresponsible to choose raving over maybe being you know a bit precautious and sacking it off for the week and seeing how things develop but again i have sympathy for both sides i think it's a really unique situation and hopefully uh we get to a point where things kind of risk go back to some kind of normality but so far the estimates don't look good let's continue on here um yeah let's let's change tack let's kind of cleanse the palette a little bit and get into some maybe it's a little bit more fun stuff so um one fun stuff to talk about is that um tres bien one of my favorite stores one of my favorite online stores let's say for streetwear and fashion has opened a store in london right that's pretty cool um maybe not the best timing in the world i'm sure well i, I don't know really you know a lot of those streetwear kids like the part the, the buying the consumers that must go on for some of those kids right so i'm sure they're going to be lining up outside that store and buying whatever they can but Again, um, London's had a very tumultuous relationship when it comes to menswear clothing stores or just clothing stores in general, especially like streetwear type places. Um, ever since the demise of Hideout, uh, the Bape Store, um, maybe even Slamming Kicks, you can include in that. 
Um, who else? The other story that was around. A few others, isn't it? I can't remember the others, but it feels as if like there's been a real gap in the market that kind of caters to the kind of streetwear audience. Of course, Dover Street Market, Selfridges, uh, Browns, End Clothing, uh, Hostem, um, Good Hood have done a good job to kind of um, uh, fill in that gap. But there's still there still feels that there's a little bit of a gap that kind of for the store that can replicate the feel of what Hideout was, right? This whole like much more of a streetwear aesthetic with a sprinkling of some luxury fashion brands. No, there wasn't a luxury fashion brands. It was predominantly streetwear and just Japanese brands, right? Which essentially isn't what streetwear is now. Streetwear now is the mix of, you know, Balenciaga triple S's and some, you know, some Amiri jeans, I'd assume, right? That kind of like mix of like that and maybe, uh, let's say a Palace sweatshirt or some shit, right? Even though you, I would say fuck Palace, but just in general, I'd say those are kind of a good example. The mix of like high, mid and low. So, and maybe like a, you know, um, uh, brain dead snapback hat or something so there is a kind of gap for that kind of stuff and maybe Tresbian would be the best example for it because you know you, you just go on their website now and they have probably one of the most eclectic you know lists of brands I think for an online store and I just in general love their approach to buying I think it's very uh, tastefully done it's obviously them just kind of scratching their own itch and buying stuff they're legitimately interested in themselves, which I think is always kind of, you always get to see, I think you always get feel of that once you're on online stores about the buying, uh, that, or the buying team's direction for what they want in a season. You can kind of see if somebody's really into the stuff that they're buying for the sake of it, for, for what they want, or if it's something that they're buying just because, you know, it's a trendy thing available now. But if you go online, you see it now, right? It's a new items on Tresby. Just have a quick scan through. You can definitely see there's a lot of kind of like, you know, um, stuff just bought for the sake of it for them, like stuff that they're interested in, right? You've got some great Nike shoes here. Some again, I'm not just sure what the plus is on what to buy when you're buying from Nike. I'm not sure if it's like if you get the limited edition stuff, you have to take some shitty stuff. But I think some brands are afforded the luxury of being able to choose from a line sheet what they want. So you know, you've got like you know these Raph Sim and Dr. Martin, some New Balances, some um, Nike ISPA. Um, Air Max 720s that are not the pop most popular shoe in the world, but again, maybe it fits their aesthetic. You've got, of course, some great brain dead uh, clothing. You've got Gimme 5 stuff in there, which again is something that only the heads will be appreciated of, and it's not something the kids that be, will be too down on. And some great books. Um, again, like look at this, like a nice model of the what's that? Uh, Adidas Hamburg in that kind of blue suede colorway. It's really nice. So, a really clever and a very purposefully and kind of meticulous uh buying processes made um Tresbian probably one of the standout online stores i think for menswear or streetwear in general right just very cleverly done of course they've got their own inline brand stuff that they do as well that's very very nice i'm a big fan of too um of course loads of nice sweatshirts here loads of nice pants and just very artistically and creatively done so they've got a new store up in london it looks very beautiful um it's somewhere where is it actually located, the address here? It's uh, in Soho, actually, which I think a lot of stores are there. I'm assuming there's loads of, like, free units or, or there's loads of available units you can kind of t take advantage of. And um, from the outside, you've got this sort of, like, um, navy blue uh, color um, on the outside decor, uh, stark white interior, uh, minimal shelving, minimal rails, some nice bits and pieces here just very kind of minimally done again very tasteful i'm interested to see how they're going to merchandise it once it's fully opened um that'll be something to check out um, once that is happening but here it is here from uh, tresbian uh article from hypebeast says they open a new flagship store um so here's the following um after is, is it on the screen so you see it yeah so after announcing plans for its international expansion late last year cult Malmo retailer tresbian has now officially opened the doors to its new location in london taking over the space in soho the store designed alongside design studio mp12 a long-time collaborator will feature a multi-brand selection alongside mainline treasure pieces which can be sick so it's going to be there you know a chance for them to kind of which is great, I think, for online stores nowadays, right? They have an opportunity, I think, since Essence do it too with their essentials um, mainline. If you have a banging online store, you are able to kind of make your own... You're able If you have a banging online store, mostly people are going to be um, drawn to your store because they trust your brand, right? They believe in your uh, the brands that you kind of bring in. They believe in your taste level in general. That's the most important thing. So with that, you should be able to make some halfway decent merch, some halfway decent pieces, or you can maybe collaborate with different brands that you have inside your store to kind of, you know, continue that great collaborative story. And then what you also got the opportunity to do is that once you've expanded to a level where you kind of, you know, generating enough income and maybe profit, 
or sales or whatever it may be you can then expand globally maybe locally uh into retail stores and you also have the ability to kind of put your own garments alongside the garments that you're stocking online in your online store and i guess there's something a little bit more tactile about seeing a tresbian sweatshirt alongside something from you know isi miyaki for instance right it kind of gives the brand it kind of gives a brand or what you're doing a little bit more context people kind of understand where you're know, coming from right you can kind of see the codes that you're using or the inspiration that you're taking from it and just in general it's nice to sit alongside brands that you're kind of aspiring to get to and it also allows people who don't know your brand to kind of wander in right some you know some passerby to kind of pop in one see a really cool hat by margaret howe or whatever and then decide you know what i might buy your sweatshirt too and that sale would have never happened if you didn't have a retail store where you could essentially put your brand alongside the high-end brand so it's a really clever way to kind of um, introduce your brand to a market that's already ready for it and again to quickly see market research if people like it or not and then double and then kind of you know um, double up the production if they don't you just kind of go back to the drawing board anyway this article continues here Officially opening the store, creative director Hans um, Hogman um, explained to Hypebeast that London is a city in Europe where we feel most at home. A city where we find a lot of inspiration, popular, popular culture, subcultures, music people. Uh, we feel very much at home here. The location is perfect, right in the middle of everything, but just a little bit out on the side so you kind of have to know where you're going. The sign is in the inside of the store, so you don't really see it if you're not looking for it. The same approach we've always had to Tresbia. We want the customer to come to us when we when, when they want to. Screaming too loud is not really in our part of DNA, which is definitely something I ascribe to and definitely like. I think you see a lot of that in the cult you know japanese or tokyo based brands that people know and love somehow you know you walk past the store seven times without realizing it's there it's down the stairway they kind of just do stuff in a very slow methodical way their own way uh, they have a cult following uh, a lower base of customers and if you get it you get it if you don't you don't but they do what they do regardless of what's going on on the outside and i think that's definitely something a, a strength of transmitting and what they're doing but i'm also interested i think the location of opening it in london is also very interesting because i think there is a lot of synergy when it comes to stylistic choices in clothing right in taste level as well uh between scandinavian countries and i'd say for the uk in general uh, there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh overlap there's a lot of uh, similarities in how we approach the stuff that we're buying into um for instance I, I look at kind of the football culture thing right the terrorist culture clothing that's something that you see a lot of scandinavian kids are wearing even if they don't watch football because it just looks cool right stone island uh rank not wranglers what what jeans do they wear i forgot their jeans but um you know adidas g adidas trainers stone island cp company uh kaggles rain jackets anoraks um, Arteryx, loads of that kind of stuff that people would wear on these terraces are now being, you know, uh, co-opted by kids, you know, in Malmo and whatever, and other far-flung places. So it's really interesting. It's a very clever idea to open a store in London in general. Um, oh, Hogman also went on to explain that the importance of being a Soho, particularly referencing the area's influence on him. So it's definitely a dream come true to be part of one of the uh, finest retail destinations in the world with so much history and culture. One of my first Soho memories is entering the hideout. Yeah, there we go. For the very first time on a sunny day in April. And I still have the same feeling when I come back to Soho. It's very much the same here. Mm, I wouldn't say that. It's weird, isn't it? Foreigners always have this reverence with London and Soho, but Soho has been dead for a while, man. It's been fucking dead out here. So a lot of the kids that I see nowadays who are really smashing on Instagram and shit, most of the time they're, you know, most of the time they get seeded things and they get sent it. But a lot of it's buying stuff online and on sales, right? There's a lot. Of, I forgot who the Asian kid is who's buying. He's always buying fucking Saint Laurent boots. But most of the stuff that he buys is on online stores. He rarely, if ever, goes to real shops to go buy stuff. And if he does, it's vintage shops and thrifts and thrift. Uh, vintage and thrift stores right or second hand stores so i think the retail scene in london for the most part has been quite shit which is why um Tresbian has the opportunity to come in and open their store i'd imagine if if, if the retail scene in london was thriving those kind of spaces wouldn't exist for them to kind of move into so i think it's an ample opportunity for them to do it but i also think they shouldn't be too optimistic about the level of i don't know vibes that, again different isn't it? i guess if you don't live in london and you pop in here right and, you're, and you come to london i don't know four times a year and you get and you just see all these new kids popping out and they all look cool and shit and the scene's thriving it could look one way and i guess when you're an industry professional it definitely has a different tinge a different glow to it because everyone's sucking your dick and everyone wants you to be part of it everyone wants you to carry their brand they want to go to they want to you know have an activation in your store they want you to co-sign them give them an intro they want you to kind of let them in on the showroom goss i don't know right i get that but i guess as a consumer i would say personally i think the london retail scene especially streetwear or menswear fashion stuff is kind of a shit 
if you guys think differently, definitely leave me a comment below and let me know. But I, I don't know, man. Like, I think that hideout era was one of the best times ever. Nowadays, I don't know. It's a bit crappy, isn't it, really? Isn't it? Like, even Slam City Skates isn't what it used to be. And that was, like, you know, one of the best places I like to go to. Even though I used to get vibed out there all the time, I used to love shopping in Slam City Skates. But I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, but anyway, that, that, that aside, great store. Glad it's open. Welcome edition. I think um, it should hopefully spark... And look, I think it's good for competition too, right? For the other retail stores to keep everyone on their toes, right? Because, you know, it, I think for the most part, Dover Street Market and Goodhood have kind of had free reign and been leading the charge in terms of styling, aesthetic and buying decisions and all that malarkey. But it would be cool to have Stresbin on board. They're going to have probably some activations there, some, you know, gallery stuff, some book launches. That would be cool to see all the cool kids in London coming out again and getting their free beers of, you know, um, Red Stripe or Carlsberg, whoever the promo, whoever the the brand sponsor is nowadays that would be quite cool to see that energy returning again and just general just kind of get a bit of a, a vibe and a destination to go to because i think that's what's lacking um nowadays but yeah um definitely check it out um Tresby in london it's on 23 meard street soho london w1f 0 ey check those guys out say hi buy some stuff uh, buy some books, buy some clothes, whatever you can. They've got a good selection of shit in there anyway. I'm a big fan of the store. I've been shopping on their online stuff from the very, from the beginning. Back when they used to have that amazing blog where they used to post all the behind the scenes stuff uh, from showrooms and stuff. That used to be really, really fucking cool. They don't do it too often now, I don't think, do they? Let's see. Do they still have that blog? That blog was so good. Yeah, they do have the blog. They used to have a little Tumblr where they show you all the showroom stuff, stuff that they've been looking at when they when they go around and stuff. That would be really cool. So definitely check it out. Um, really cool. Oh, they had the opening party too. Who DJ there? Colonel Kovacs. Whoa, fucking hell. That was sick, isn't it? Nice one. So definitely check it out. Big fan of it. Um, loads of cool stuff to check out. Tresbia, the fucking bosses. So um, that's it, isn't it? I think for the show. Episode number 291. Friends, again for checking me out. It's been a pleasure to have you here um, by my side, listening to the things I speak about. Next show will be mostly streetwear, so it'll be a little bit more of a lighter mood. Forgive me for the downtrodden mood here, but we know we have to speak about to speak about. As per usual, if you listen to this via the podcast app and you want to share this and you want to get it out there, definitely do that. Leave me a five-star review. If you're watching via YouTube, smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the show, topics you want me to speak about, other things. Um, if you want to tell me some other stuff, then do that too. Make sure it's nice, yeah? Don't hurt my feelings. <laughs> but apart from that, um, be safe, be well, take care of each other, you know, wash your hands, cover your mouth when you sneeze um, and cough and all that stuff. You know, follow the medical uh, recommendations from wherever you're following them, them from. Or if you don't know who to follow them from, then definitely check out the World Health Organization on Twitter. They've got some really cool videos and pieces of information that you can follow. And um, above all, be safe, take care. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Peace out.